Welcome back to the new you, God's best for your life. This is session number eight, and today we're talking about new power. The new you comes with new power, thank God. Where God wants to take you in your life is gonna require resources and abilities that you don't have on your own. But praise God, this life is not about self-help, it's about God help. It's about what you and God can do together. Some people think it's all about independence and I gotta, you know, do everything myself. Uh, that's not true. When it comes to this life, it's you partnering together with God. Other people think, oh, it's all about dependency upon God. I'm gonna sit on the couch and eat bonbons all day and pray that he does a miracle in my life. That's not how it works either. How God works is in interdependence, you and him working together, and that is a match made in heaven. Listen, you need power. The Christian life is not about what you can do, it's about what you and God can do. So you cannot do God's work without God's power. You cannot become the new you without God's power. He's doing something in you and through you. So this session is all about that divine element that God kicks into your life that will take you where you cannot take yourself. Zechariah chapter four, verse six says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Another translation puts it this way. I am the all-powerful Lord, so don't depend on your own power and strength, but on my spirit. That is so true. We don't just want to depend upon ourselves. We want to partner together with God in this journey called life. There was a time in my life, I can remember it like it was yesterday, I was going through a lot of stuff in my life one of the biggest trials I had ever gone through. And it was a Wednesday night, I was at this church service and the pastor gave an altar call. And now I've been a pastor my whole life, but now I'm sitting in somebody else's church, listening to somebody else preach to me. And I felt like, you know, I should respond. And yet I was feeling kind of weird, like, no, I'll just pray here in my seat. I don't need to go forward. And yet I really felt the Lord compelling me to step out in faith and to do what I had asked so many people to do before and to go forward. So I did. And God met me in that place. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Gary, I have power for you that is not your own. And I needed to hear that because I'm a type A person, I'm very driven and I'll find a way to get things done. But when it comes to this thing that God is trying to do in us and through us, we don't have what it takes on our own. We need God to come in and do what only He can do. And that night, I felt empowered, I felt my burden lifted, I felt energy that didn't come from me, it came from God in me, and it made all the difference. It gave me hope, it gave me a new spark, and it shifted my focus. If you feel like you've got to do it all, that's a heavy load. You're going to crack under that pressure eventually. But when you feel like you and God are doing it together, it's so uplifting. It's like the wind beneath your wings that's always there to empower you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. In other words, this whole Christian life is not just a bunch of talk. There's proof in the pudding. When God begins to empower you, you can do what you could never do before. Now, when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that he was empowered by the Spirit of God. Everything that Jesus he did, he did by the same Holy Spirit power that's available to you and to me. 
In fact, listen to this verse in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. It comes right after Jesus had fasted for 40 days. And when he was done fasting and spending time with God, it says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the region. So Jesus spent that quality time with the Father, and when he was about ready to kick off his ministry, he did it after he had been empowered by the Lord himself. In fact, the, the title, Christ, Jesus the Christ, is not just his first name and last name. Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. That's his mission. And Christ means the anointed one. So one really speaks of his authority and the other one speaks of his power that he's going to have to fulfill that authority. The word Christ means the anointed one. There's no one anointed like Jesus is anointed. What does that mean? To be anointed means that the power, the presence, and the purpose of God is operating in your life. And you could see in the life of Jesus that he was anointed. The presence of God was on him. The power of God was flowing through him. It was just something beautiful to behold. His joy, his peace, his wisdom was otherworldly because he was partnering together with the Father. In fact, Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went out doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. I love that. Because we're called to live like Jesus lived. And he did it by the power of the Spirit of God. We too have to do it by the power of the Spirit of God. Jesus was casting out demons and healing the sick and forgiving sins and controlling nature and overcoming death. All by the power of the Spirit of God. And what I love is that Jesus was training up the disciples to do what he had been doing. In fact, in Luke 9, 1, it says that he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And so now they are experiencing the same power operating through them. After Jesus was resurrected, he's getting ready to go back to heaven where he came from. And he's equipping his disciples to carry on his ministry. And one of the things that Jesus wanted to get very clear is that they were not yet equipped to do what he was calling them to do. You're not yet ready to go out and change the world. You don't have what it takes. But he said to them in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So that is the promise that came from the Father, that he was going to empower his people to carry on the work of Christ. They weren't ready, they had the mission, but they didn't yet have the transmission from God to carry out that mission. So they need to wait for the Holy Spirit. And then we read later in Acts 1 verse 8, see Luke is volume one and Acts is volume two, the same author, two books that really are put together. So at the end of the first volume, Luke 24, we have this promise. And then at the beginning of volume two in Acts chapter one, we see the fulfillment of that promise. Jesus says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then in Acts chapter two, we see that taking place where on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came upon those early disciples 
and the promise was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit had come and now they're ready to operate in that anointing to do what call, God called them to do. Jesus said, hey, you're going to receive power. That word is dunamis in the Greek language. Dynamite, explosive, supernatural power was coming to them. And this is not an impersonal power. I don't want you to think of the power of God like electricity. You can just plug it in and unplug it. No, the power is a person. We're talking about the Holy Spirit in our lives. God is a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what happened after the resurrection? Jesus said, I'm going back to heaven, but I'm going to tag in the Holy Spirit and he's going to come and now he's going to be in you and he's going to work through you to carry on this Christian momentum. And so that's absolutely key that we would now work with the Holy Spirit to live this new life. You can't do it on your own. And, but when you work with the Holy Spirit, then all things become possible. The Holy Spirit is called our helper. I love that because it's a very personal term. I, you know, it's like God is my help. The Holy Spirit is my helper. Lord, I can't do this on my own. He says, hey, I'm here to help. I love that. When Jesus was training the disciples about what was going to be coming with the Holy Spirit, he said in John 14, 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit reinforces everything that Jesus does in our life. And it's that Spirit of God, that Holy Spirit, that is the X factor that we see in all these great stories throughout Scripture. It was the Holy Spirit that was helping Noah with the ark. It was the Holy Spirit that was with Abraham creating a new nation. It was the Holy Spirit who was with Moses leading the nation of Israel out of bondage and into the promised land. It was the Holy Spirit with David overcoming giants and it was the Holy Spirit with Daniel and all the amazing exploits that he did. It was the Holy Spirit with the early church that was doing incredible things. I would challenge you to read through the book of Acts with fresh eyes to see all the incredible things the Holy Spirit's doing. One example, Paul and Silas had been put in prison for preaching the gospel. And scripture says that about midnight, when things are at their darkest, Paul and Silas are worshiping and praising God. They're getting in the spirit. They're getting that anointing. They're partnering with God. They're teaming up with the Holy Spirit. They're getting that holy help. And scripture says that man at midnight, an earthquake came. God did something that nobody else could do. The doors burst open and they walked out freely. Uh, an incredible move of God. When did it happen? It happened in the power of praise. It happened when Paul and Silas were calling on God and connecting with God, and then God kicked in and did what only God could do. That's how it works. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Friends, God can do more than you think he can do. God can take you further than you've ever been before. He can do more than you can even imagine by his power that works in you. I want to encourage you today to believe in that power, to call on that power, and to work in that power because you can't be the husband, the wife, the mother, the father, the witness, the employer, the employee, the Christian that God's called you to be. You can't be the new you 
without the new power. You need to work together with God to get there. So how then are you filled with the Holy Spirit? It's one thing to be born of the Spirit. It's another thing to be filled with the Spirit. We are leaky vessels, right? I mean, God fills us up, but then we slowly leak and we need to be filled again and again and again. Scripture says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Or in the original Greek language, be being filled. It's in the perfect tense. It's an ongoing action. Continually be filled and refilled and filled again with the Holy Spirit, with God's presence in your life. I love this verse because it contrasts uh, alcohol to the Spirit of God. What happens when you drink too much alcohol? You come under the influence. In fact, uh, a DUI is driving under the influence. You're influenced by alcohol and therefore you shouldn't be driving. Well, in the same way, we can come under the influence of the Spirit of God. How powerful is that? You've probably heard preachers that are anointed and under God's influence, and there's an X factor there. There's a God factor there that is beautiful and it's powerful. You've probably been in a church service where the worship leader is anointed. And because of that, man, God's flowing through that worship leader and it creates an atmosphere that is majestic. That's the difference. We've all heard sermons that have no anointing. We've all been in worship services where the worship leader wasn't anointed and it was just flat. And I mean, God's still working, but not as powerful. And so when people are under the influence of God's spirit, man, that's where the magic happens. So don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of alcohol. That's dissipation. What does that mean? Things that dissipate, they just disappear. Your life is just going to disappear and vanish and you'll have nothing if that's what you're under the influence of. But when you're under the influence of God's Spirit, it's eternal, it lasts, and you can be proud of it. So, how are you filled with the Spirit? Well, that word filled is the same word that describes the way the wind fills the sail of a sailboat. It's the Greek word pleroo. So what happens when a sailboat hoists its sail? The wind then can fill the sail and the boat can come under this invisible, unseen power. In the same way, you and I can come under that same invisible, unseen power Whenever we hoist our hearts to God and we say, God, work in me and work through me right now. I give myself as a vessel for you. Father, I can't do this on my own. Be with me. Help me. Empower me. Let's do this together. And boom, God's going to fill you up in that moment. You don't have to feel anything special necessarily. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. But here's my experience. As a preacher, I cannot tell you how many times that I came to the pulpit with the best I could do. I had studied, I had prepared. But once I started preaching, once the anointing came on me, it's like just something else happened. God took my water and he turned it into wine and brought it to life and it was anointed. And friends, I'm telling you, there are so many times I step down from the pulpit and God's like, "Woo, that was good. You know what you went up to that pulpit with and you know what you stepped down with. I met you. I did something amazing. I turned your water, Gary, into wine and that was powerful. I'm like, wow, Lord. I know what I brought up there, and you did something amazing. I know what happened. Even if the people don't know, I know. And usually the people did know. 
In fact, I could hear people say, Gary, there's like a different look in your eye when that anointing comes on you. It's just something happens in you and all of a sudden God is working. You're under that influence and the spirit is moving. So what did I do to get in that place? Surrendered my heart to God. Before I preach, I just say, Lord, here's my heart. I hoist the sail. Holy Spirit, fill me. I want to come under your influence. I want this to be about you, God, and not about me. And then, boom, God begins to take over. I can't fully explain it to you. It's kind of like weightlifting. If you've ever been in the gym and you've had a spotter, you're there at the bench press, let's say, and somebody's standing behind you to help you. It's, it's a heavy weight. You don't know if you can fully lift it or how many reps you can do. And that person's there just to help and so you don't choke yourself to death. And so, man, sometimes they're there. And sometimes with just one finger, just a little bit of help, they can help you get that bar up. Sometimes it's just two fingers is all they need to offer to help you get that bar up. Sometimes they're like, oh my gosh, you're, you're dying here on me and they've got to put a lot of strength in. You never fully know how much of it was your strength, how much of it was your spotter's strength. It's the same with God. Sometimes it's like, God, that was 90% you. I almost did nothing. And other times it's like 80% you and God just kicked in that extra 20% or whatever. You never really know. And it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that people can see God and that God gets the glory. And whenever you are filled with the Spirit, God does something amazing. So I want to challenge you. Continually get filled with the Spirit. Hoist your heart to God. We need to do this, you guys, over and over and over again. It's a daily thing. You don't do this once or twice or a hundred times. You got to do it for the rest of your life. Every day, come to God. Lord, fill me. Anoint me. I don't want to do this day alone. I don't want to do this day on my own strength. Let's do it together, God. So I want to give you some ways that you can connect with God and you can get filled with the Spirit. They're very simple and you've probably done them before. One is prayer. When you pray, Somehow, by talking to God, you connect with God. And sometimes the situation hasn't even changed yet, but we've changed. And therefore, we know that the situation ultimately is going to change. Prayer helps us connect with God. Prayer helps us call upon His help. Prayer helps us to say, hey, God, here's the situation. Let's work together on this, God. Give me this day my daily bread, you know. Another thing you can do is worship. Paul and Silas praised God in that prison. I want to encourage you, get YouTube out, get your CD out, get your radio out, whatever you do. And man, let some of these pros, Hillsong or Chris Tomlin or Jesus Culture or Elevation Church or whatever you're into, just lead you into the presence of God and just worship from your heart. It's going to help you connect and get filled up. Another thing you do is get out in nature. I mean, I'm telling you, living here on the beach in Nias, Indonesia, it's a godsend. I'm, I'm in nature every day. When I go out surfing, I'm literally swimming around in the nature of God, and it refreshes me every time. One of the things I love to do is go on a walk on the beach. Sometimes I'll walk for hours, just me and God, just getting alone in nature where the energy of God's creation, that alone time with God, it just fills me up. Another thing you can do is get your Bible out and meditate on scripture. It's amazing how that when you read scripture, sometimes it just pops off the page to you and just fills you up. Another thing is fasting. If you've never done that, the purpose of fasting is going without food or, or, or some activity in your life. You can fast from television or social media or whatever. But the idea is to take back that time and give it to God. The time you would normally spend preparing and eating and cleaning up after the meal, you give that time to God and you can get filled up. 
Another great way is fellowship. Just getting around other Christians is a great filler. I mean, sometimes I'm so empty and I get around my brothers and sisters and boom, they inspire me. They spur me on. It's like, okay, let's go. And another one is service. Get out of yourself. Quit thinking about yourself and just get into somebody else. It's amazing how that when you just serve and you do something for somebody else, even picking up trash around the church or fixing something at your neighbor's house or whatever, just serve somebody in the name of Jesus, it will fill you up. These are just a few things that you can do, but I'm telling you, they work. Don't be so busy in life that you don't have time to connect with God. Satan would love for you to just press on the gas so that you run into a wall. It reminds me of Mary and Martha. Two sisters, Jesus had come over to their house to teach and Martha's in the kitchen doing dishes and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus taking in his wisdom. And Mary comes in, she's like, Jesus, tell my sister Mary to get in there and help me in the kitchen. This isn't fair. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. Mary has chosen the better part and I'm not going to take it away from her. She's sitting at my feet. Imagine missing the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus to go do the dishes. I'm pretty sure they'll still be there later on. We need to take time to get filled up with God. Whatever that is for you, driving in your car with some Christian music on, taking a walk on the beach and praying, whatever you need to do, do it, do it well, and do it often. Because when you connect with God, then God, you get in alignment with Him, His Spirit, His energy, His anointing is going to flow in and through your life. I want to encourage you, friend, you are empowered. You're empowered with faith. You're empowered with hope. You're empowered with purpose, empowered with new identity and new authority. God's given you everything you need to be the new you and to live this Christian life. It's time to tune in and to turn on and to do all that God wants to do in and through you. So I want to say a prayer for you. I want to lead you in a prayer that God would just freshly empower you and anoint you. Would you just maybe lift your hands to God as a sign that you want to hoist the sail of your heart and be filled with His Spirit fresh and new today? And then after we pray, I'll give you a sticky statement. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for my friends. I thank you that they're lifting their hands in surrender to you right now. God, would you fill them? Would you cleanse their heart and fill them with your spirit so that they're under your influence? An influence of love and kindness and self-control and joy and power. Fill them to overflowing, Lord, so they can shine brightly for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, here's a statement for you. Something that you can say to get you back into this state of being filled up and under the influence of God. Say, I am equipped with the power, presence, and purpose of God. You can just say that to yourself. I am equipped with the power, presence, and purpose of God. Yes, you are. I love you guys. I'm so proud of you. Until the next session, keep looking up.